Mani Naputni. Welcome all of you. It's wonderful uh, that you've, you've come and it's wonderful to see so many people here this evening. I begin by acknowledging the Ghana people as the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we meet today. And I pay my respects to Elders past and present. 30 years ago, Flinders University opened a brand new law school committed to social justice, law reform, and with a focus on innovative teaching. One of the founding academics was the Honourable Elliot Johnston AOQC. Tonight, as we celebrate this 30th anniversary year of Law at Flinders, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 22nd Elliot Johnston AOQC oration proudly hosted by Flinders University's Office of Indigenous Strategy and Engagement and the College of Business, Government and Law. My name is Tanya Lehman. I'm the Dean of Law and I'm delighted to welcome you all this evening as we commemorate the life and the impact of the Honourable Elliot Johnston and celebrate the outstanding achievements of our speaker this evening. Flinders Law Alumna, Director of the Aboriginal Justice Unit in the Northern Territories Department of the Attorney General and Justice, recipient of a 2021 Flinders University Distinguished Alumni Award, and 2022 Northern Territory Australian of the Year. Welcome Leanne Liddell. It is good to have you with us. Welcome also to all of you and in particular to our distinguished guests, the Honourable Kyle Ma, Attorney General, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Minister for Industrial Relations and Public Sector, and uh, also representing the Premier this evening. The Honourable Tammy Franks, MLC, Senator Karen Liddell, Uncle Lewis uh, Yalapurka O'Brien, AO, Senior Elder on Campus, and Vice-Chancellor Professor Colin Sterling and members of the university's senior leadership team. Some of you may have known Elliot well, but for those who did not, I read from the foreword to the edited collection of these lectures, Indigenous Australians, Social Justice and Legal Reform, honouring Elliot Johnston, published by Federation Press in 2016. Elliot's exemplary life celebrates above all else a sense of self, a sense of the other and appreciation of the systems they inhabit. At times paradoxical, Elliot was able to sustain a lifelong commitment to communism with equal dedication to professional success inside the law. While demonstrating and witnessing the many injustices inflicted on Indigenous Australians, at the same time, Elliot fought tirelessly to improve the integrity and efficacy of the legal system that frequently excludes unpopular causes and minorities. Elliot may have been a dedicated communist and therefore an outsider, but he was also very much an independent, free-thinking professional who both understood and improved citadels of state power he managed to enter. The law practice Elliot Johnston, Barrister and Solicitor, was founded over 70 years ago and has gone through several iterations until its current iteration, Johnston Withers Lawyers. We would particularly like to thank Johnston Withers for their generous sponsorship for this lecture over what is now many years and once again this year. There are several housekeeping matters I must bring to your attention. The lecture is being videoed and live streamed. There will be an opportunity for questions following Leanne's address. And so that questions can be captured for the live stream audience, please wait for the microphone to come to you. Toilets are located out through the doors and at the eastern end of the lift foyer. In the very unlikely an event of an emergency, please use the stairs at each end of the foyer and then gather outside down on the eastern edge of Victoria Square. And we are delighted to welcome not only those in the room, but also those joining us online from across South Australia, the Northern Territory and beyond. 
And if you're joining us online, please feel free to visit slido.com and enter the code hashtag EJOration2022 to engage and post any questions. It's now my great pleasure to invite Senior Elder on campus and Ghana Elder, Uncle Lewis Yalapurka O'Brien, to welcome us to his country. Maruichanga, Kana Mina Nai Wangani, Mani Nibuni Gani Atana, Nai Biriko, Mankanakalo, Tandanya, Mianaku, Nature Young and Dalia, Nature Yakan and Dalia, Padni Adlu Wadu. On behalf of the Ghana people, I welcome you all to Ghana country, and I do this ambassador of the Adelaide Plains people. My brothers, my sisters, let's walk together in harmony. Natalia. Thank you very much, Uncle Lewis, for delivering the welcome to country for tonight's event. I would now like to introduce the Honourable Kaim Ma, Attorney General of South Australia and Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, who tonight represents the Premier of South Australia to provide our opening address. <laughs> uh, thank you very much and thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, thank you, Uncle Lewis, for your very generous welcome to your country. And it, it is great, and, to, and we, I hear it more and more often, to hear you speaking in the language of your people to us tonight. It, it, bring, it brings joy to my heart to hear that. And, uh, and thank you, you and, and your family, for how much you've done for reconciliation over the many years and, and what you do for the university as the elder on campus. Thank you, Uncle Lewis. And, uh, and I want to... Uh, 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 pay tribute to the cultural authority of all other Aboriginal people that are here today from many, many uh, nations across this state. You know, where, wherever you wake up, whether it's in Adelaide on Ghana land, uh, anywhere in South Australia, you're in one of, dozen, of dozens and dozens of Aboriginal nations or anywhere in Australia of the hundreds of nation, Aboriginal nations that make up what we now call Australia. Um, uh, I was thrilled to hear uh, that Leanne Little would be delivering tonight's oration uh, talking about uh, the work of Elliot and also the, the incredibly important work that Leanne's done that uh, sees her so recognised in the Northern Territory uh, for work that Elliot Johnson would think is so, so important in the area of justice. Um, I was fortunate only on a few times to meet uh, Elliot and Elizabeth Johnson. Uh, I have been involved in the Labor Party for many, many, many years and, of course, Elliot and Elizabeth were heavily involved in progressive politics, a bit further left than, uh, than myself, or probably even further left than the Honourable Tammy Franks from the Greens who's here today uh, with, with the Communist Party. But certainly, um, you know, uh, Elliot and Elizabeth uh, were both very generous in their time to people coming through the progressive side of politics in, in talking about uh, you know, what they had learnt, uh, their experiences, and particularly with the trade union movement. I think you know, Elliot at one stage represented 19 unions uh, as, at his practice uh, at what is now Johnson Withers. Uh, it, it is interesting too to reflect yeah, uh, the, the, how times have changed, particularly with um, yeah, Elliot Johnson's involvement in politics as a lifelong dedicated member, member of the Communist Party. Um, Elliot Johnson from a Liberal government in the, uh, uh, was refused appointment as a Queen's Council to recognise him as you know, one of the state's pre-eminent uh, barristers, which he was for a very, very long time. And it, it wasn't until the election of a Dunstan government that a communist was able to uh, to, to hold the uh, position of QC. Um, and uh, I, I think at the time it was claimed that... Uh, uh, Elliot Johnson had attained the highest office anywhere in Australia by a communist when he was appointed a QC <laughs> uh, in South Australia. Um, and the long shadow of the Red Scare at the time meant that yeah, there was much consternation um, uh, in terms of Elliot's um, yeah, political views. Yeah, he was a committed intellectual. He studied at Chairman Mao's International Communist School, visited Soviet Russia before and after the fall of Stalin, and sat a few feet from Pablo Picasso at the 1950 Peace Congress in Warsaw. Yeah, he was a, yeah, committed to his ideals no matter what personal cost. Uh, he was also committed to improving the rights and the lot of people who needed help in society, who faced disadvantage and, uh, and needed um, the people like Elliot and Elizabeth Johnson's 
help in getting a, yeah, a fair go and a fair share. He was committed in areas of, of improving workers' rights through his work with uh, trade union movements and through in, uh, injured workers. Uh, he was also uh, committed to improving the lives of dis, uh, uh, and helping overcome the disadvantage so many Aboriginal people face. Uh, Elliot Johnson, yeah, possibly, I think, his, one of his greatest contributions in his life uh, was as a commissioner for the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Uh, but finally, our report was published in 1991, which was yeah, a, a big few years, I think, in, uh, in, in progress with legal um, um, uh, achievements and legal change. The, the report being handed down uh, of the Aboriginal Deaths in Custody in 1991, and of course, the very next year, the High Court handed down their decision in the Mabo Number no. 2 case. Um, and I, I think yeah, Elliot's work can't really be understated when you look at the contribution as a, uh, as a lawyer, as a Supreme Court judge, and as a Royal Commissioner to Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. I think it's quite a remarkable body of work that is worth remembering and worth uh, paying tribute to with orations like this. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say uh, uh, tonight, Leanne, and uh, looking forward to attending more of these in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Ma, for formally opening tonight's proceedings. Before we welcome my colleague, Associate Professor Simone Lacateur, to introduce tonight's speaker, I would like to invite Richard Bradsaw, Special Counsel at Johnston Withers Lawyers, to say a few words on behalf of our sponsor. Welcome, Richard. Well, I don't need to make any gags about my microphone. <laughs> First and foremost, um, I would like to acknowledge that we are all on Ghana land and that the Johnston Withers office in Adelaide is, of course, on Ghana land. And we pay respects to the Ghana elders, past, present and emerging. And thank you, um, uh, Uncle Lewis uh, Yalupurka O'Brien, for your kind welcome. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Kaya Ma um, as the first Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Aboriginal Aboriginal Minister for Aboriginal Affairs in this uh, state, um, which is wonderful, uh, as well as being the Attorney General, which is also wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say that um, he is following in the footsteps, more particularly, of some very fine liberal attorneys general. Um, and uh, uh, they were always ones that I felt were more prepared to listen than your predecessors on your side of politics. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a shame, but I'm sure that you will be different in that respect. Um, I am here representing uh, Johnston Withers, um, not least because uh, our senior partner and managing director, Andrew Mitchard, um, is very, he's very disappointed that he is not here today um, and he would be otherwise um, uh, giving this um, uh, short presentation, believe me. Um, but uh, he apologises for not being here because he has to be outside of Adelaide on other matters. So he's sent me to, and I'm very happy to be here to, on his behalf and to make the, the uh, presentation. Um, as a worker for Johnston Withers, uh, for the past 32 years, um, I have always taken uh, joy in remembering the soil from which the firm grew the intensely humane, politically challenging, collective ethos of its founders, um, Elliot and, um, and Elizabeth Johnston. From them came concern for workers' rights, women's rights, Aboriginal rights, and social, economic, and political justice generally. 
Eliot's rise, despite his politics, which I don't need to go into the, now that um, Kayyem has, uh, in, has gone into some detail. Uh, but at any rate, his rise to being a QC, the Supreme Court Justice, a Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, provided the impetus for the cre creation of this lecture series. It started in 1998 with a, an inaugural lecture by Father Frank Brennan, a strenuous advocate for Aboriginal land rights. From the beginning, this has been a partnership between the law firm Elliot founded and Flinders University, where he taught law in his so-called retirement from the bench. It has been an annual event since 2018, after which, and until 2018, until uh, after which uh, institutional matters and the pandemic uh, intervened. So there hasn't been one for four years. We are thrilled to have Leanne Little resume this oratorial tradition. Leanne embodies so much of what was important to Eliot. You will hear a great deal about Leanne from the next speaker, who I think it's Tanya. It's mine. No, it, it's you're going to be. No, I'll be introducing you. And you'll be introducing <laughs> Leanne. Great. What I would like to add is is something very short about Leanne's family, or more particularly, we're talking the Littles. <laughs> As someone who spent nine, eight years rather in Alice Springs. Um, Alice Springs is, in many respects, ground zero for the flowering of Aboriginal self-determination in this country, in land rights, health, legal matters, and housing. The Little family were everywhere involved in these critical developments. They were and remain at the forefront. Johnston Withers has been involved in many of these developments for the past 50 years. Elliot was the founding chair of the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement. His lawyers were involved with what, with what became the Central Land Council uh, in what might have been the first land rights claim before the Northern Territory Land Rights Act was passed. Supplejack. They were involved in the passage of the Pitjantjara Land Rights Act and the Royal Commission into British Nuclear Tests. We have been and continue to be involved in a variety of land rights, native title and Aboriginal heritage and related uh, issues. Our involvement in these issues is of course fully reflective of Eliot's values and objectives in the law. That's enough from me, and we look forward very much to hearing what Leanne has to say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard, for your address, and also, again, to thank Johnson & Withers lawyers for their sponsorship for the event tonight. And it was wonderful to hear you reflect on um, Elliot, but also um, your connection with my late mother as well um, in terms of the work you've undertaken. Um, before I introduce our orator for tonight, I just wanted to have a, a, a moment of reflection around Elliot. When you get to MC events, you also get to spend a lot of time with very important people. And obviously, I had the wonderful opportunity of actually picking Elliot up one time in my little yellow car. And he was very kind. And we talked a lot about the work that he'd undertaken in terms of the Royal Commission, um, but also his strong sense of justice. So it's so wonderful to actually have um, this oration commence again by Flinders University and Johnston Withers. So I'd like to thank Uncle Lewis Yalaburka O'Brien for his welcome to country uh, as one of our elders on campus at Onganiyada at Flinders. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Annie Pat Miller, who was actually going to be here tonight from Narada country, but unfortunately was unwell. But we did have the opportunity to actually um, speak to Annie Pat, Leanne and I did just before this um, afternoon, and she sends her best wishes to Leanne and also her apology to everyone. But I'd also like to acknowledge Uncle Richard Fijo, our other elder on campus um, on Larrakia country in Darwin. Um, and in particular, acknowledge Leanne's country as a central Arundel woman and her family. 
So it's such an honour to introduce our speaker tonight um, for the 2022 Elliot Johnston oration, Leanne Little. Leanne is the Director of Aboriginal Justice Unit, Department of the Attorney General and Justice in Northern Territory. And as mentioned previously, the 2022 Northern Territory Australian of the Year, a Flinders graduate, and in 2021, a Distinguished Alumni Awardee. On a personal note, I have known Leanne's family for a very long time. And in fact, I want to um, also say hello to Karen, um, who I've known for a long time as well. And in particular, Leanne's connection to my late mother, who actually um, undertook cultural training and awareness with SAPO in the 80s and 90s, um, but also the works in the court. So the connection is a long connection and it's very special. But I also have another connection with Leanne. Um, as you mentioned, um, Lynn, Leanne is a, a Flinders alumni and I was actually at Jungerensi at that time supporting Leanne as a student <laughs> when she was undertaking her law degree. And so lots of connections and it's wonderful to have you here tonight. What a privilege. Leanne continues her passion and drive for justice for Aboriginal communities. And this is no means an easy task because with that requires um, passion, commitment, but also a very strong stature um, to deal with critics as well. Her current role as Director of the Aboriginal Justice Unit based in Darwin has involved travelling around thousands of kil um, kilometres to meet and listen to over 120 Aboriginal communities, to hear the reasons for and solutions to the over-representation of Aboriginal people in the justice system. In 1988, Leanne was South Australia's first Aboriginal policewoman, and I do remember that. And during her decade-plus service, she experienced racism and abuse that she fought, but used these experiences to fuel her passion to make a difference in justice. As mentioned, Leanne went on to complete a law degree at Flinders with honours which we're very proud of, has since worked for the United Nations and has had several high profile government roles. Leanne is a member of the Royal Flying Doctor Board for SANT and the Deputy Chair of the Menzies School of Health and as mentioned, received um, the honour of the 2022 Northern Territory Australian of the Year. I was also privileged um, to hear Leanne speak at Gama this year, where also the Prime Minister spoke around for, for the, um, the Uluru Statement of the Heart, where Leanne called out racism across all levels of power. And it is from this strong standpoint that grounds Leanne's commitment to empowering Aboriginal Territorians, but I think all Aboriginal people as well, the reach is large, with justice solutions that will work where others have failed. But as I introduce Leanne today, Justice Judith Kelly referred to Leanne Skarma's speech as calling anti-racism a religion or a cult. So this demonstrates the work ahead of us as a society and the tasks that we all need to undertake. It is therefore my great pleasure to invite Leanne to offer this year's 2022 Elliot Johnston oration titled Red Silk, Black Voices. Please make Leanne feel welcome. Thank you for those kind words. It's on. My first duty is to acknowledge that I'm presenting on Ghana Country. And I pay my respects to Elders past and present and emerging, as well as all the other Aboriginal people in the audience today. I'd also like to acknowledge Flinders Vice-Chancellor Professor Colin Sterling, members of his senior executive team, university staff, fellow graduates and event sponsors, uh, Johnston Withers Lawyers. I'd also like to acknowledge the Honourable Tammy Franks, MLC, uh, my sister, older sister, um, just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> Senator Karen Little at the back there, the Honourable Kai Ma, MLC, and Uncle Lewis AO. Thank you. Let me also apologise, Chris Larkin and Chris Charles, if I failed to acknowledge other people more important room in the in the room today. So welcome everybody. It's an immense honour to be asked to give the Elliot Johnson Memorial Lecture. 
I want to take you back to 1988, the first year of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. I was a young, keen and green police cadet who was due to get graduate as a police officer that year in December. Part of our training was to assist with crowd control at the annual David Jones Christmas pageant. We had to keep people, legs and kids behind the newly painted thin blue line. But before I went on, on duty, I was taken aside and I was told by my superior officers that there could be protests about the Royal Commission. So should there be any signs of protesters or rioters, then I was to remove myself immediately, make my way to the nearby Angus Street headquarters via the back door. Ironically, my post was right smack bang out the front of the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement office on King William Street, which I thought and I knew was the safest place for me to be. Throughout my 11 year career in SAPOL, including following the release of the Royal Commission's final report, I saw and I heard how governments defended themselves against the issues the Royal Commission had identified. I saw huge investments and substantial efforts placed into mitigating the risks for government. Yes, there were police cells that had removed hanging points. Yes, there was new bedding and non-rip clothing for prisoners. And yes, there were cultural, there were cultural awareness programs for new police officers. But I knew all too well that this was just veneer because very little had actually changed for Aboriginal people. For too many years and for too many hours, I sat around large board tables as a junior policy officer listening to bureaucrats and senior police with shiny brass royal crowns on their epaulets that should have weighed heavily on their conscience. But instead, they declared out aloud and proudly to other bureaucrats how they had fully implemented the Royal Commission's recommendation with vigour and merit. In fact, I actually recall at some point people talking about awards and medals for all those involved. But sitting there at every meeting, I was fully aware of my lived and professional experiences that not one Aboriginal person from any community had been engaged in this entire process because we just weren't around the tables, because we just weren't invited. I remember thinking to myself, how could it be that the very people that the Royal Commission's recommendations were supposed to help were not the ones signing off on the progress and certainly not the ones who were invited to participate in discussions around the boardroom. These were just some of the painful lessons that would be learnt and relearned far too often across my career in the public service. As my police career steadily progressed, I became aware of a pattern, a pattern that disturbed me and kept me up at night. Because whenever an Aboriginal person died in custody, Despite it being on page two of national newspapers, as well as being featured on the national news, the discussions around police station lunchrooms were unburdened by any hints of responsibility, let alone accountability. This was despite the fact that I knew from my own research and from, what, and from watching the media coverage that two critical recommendations of the Royal Commission was targeted at police and the judiciary. These being arrest and secondly, imprisonment was to be a last resort for Aboriginal people. But not once do I ever recall these recommendations ever being addressed in any training course or deliverable, nor in any arrest or imprisonment of any Aboriginal person in the decade plus time that I had in SAPOL. In fact, I recall just the opposite, because more times than I can remember, I recall senior police convincing and telling other police, including myself, that the only safe place for Aboriginal people was a police cell. 
I ask all of you here tonight this question. How could we ignore such an important and integral human right with an ad hoc dismissal when we knew what was at stake? One wonders where we would be today, how different the data and statistics would be and how the lives of so many other Aboriginal people would be unimpacted if only police had played just as much effort and concern in undoing police culture as they had the physical infrastructure of the cells, bedding and more. I had the pleasure of meeting Elliot and Elizabeth Johnson at their home behind St Andrew's Hospital during the time when I was running my legal case of racism against SAPOL. At the time, I remember, I was surprised to see that they had an old model car. But I was even more impressed when I saw that inside their house there was little furniture and exhibits. I'm not sure what I expected, but I had been exposed to so many other lawyers and prosecutors who filled their house with assets, trinkets, awards and pictures of their achievements and efforts that maybe I thought Elliot was the same. But it didn't take me long to see that he was not. Elliot had told the Aboriginal legal rights movement, then senior civil lawyer, Joanna Richardson, who is now a judge and here tonight, <laughs> that we had a solid case, which greatly encouraged me in sticking to my guns in that daunting task. I can say that no one from the law who I have met since has possessed Elliot's understanding of Aboriginal affairs. He was well ahead of his time, at least, I'd say, 50 years. So what did the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody find? Between the 1st of January 1980 and the 31st of May 1989, 99 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people died in the custody of police, prison or juvenile detention and institutions. There were 88 males and 11 females. Their approximate age at death was 32 years, ranging in age from just 14 to 62 years. All their deaths were premature and varied, and to their families, they were suspicious. On the face of it, there appeared to be no common threads of abuse or neglect. However, examining the lives of the 99 revealed that their Aboriginality played a significant and in most cases dominant role in them being in custody and consequently then dying in custody. The Royal Commission was established by the Hawke Government in October 1987 in response to a growing public concern that deaths in custody of Aboriginal people were very common. And official explanations were too evasive to discount the possibility that foul play was a factor in many of them. Public agitation for a Royal Commission was led by members of the Aboriginal community. It is revealing commentary on the life experiences of Aboriginal people and their history of racism that it was assumed by so many Aboriginal people that many, if not most of the deaths, were a result of murder being committed if not on behalf of the state, well, at least by officers of the state. It turned out that disquiet and disbelief in the official explanations of these deaths were not only expressed by Aboriginal people, as non-Aboriginal people too shared the concerns that police and prison officers' misconduct would be disclosed by a Royal Commission. These non-Aboriginal Australians, whilst not sharing the lived experiences of Aboriginal people, had seen and heard sufficient evidence of the mistreatment of Aboriginal people to share the fear that Aboriginal people would suffer and die from the discrimination and brutality they were confronted with in their daily lives. The task given to the Commission by the Letters Patent was to inquire into the deaths in custody and into, I quote, any subsequent action taken in respect of each of those deaths, including the conduct of coronial, place and other inquiries, and any other things that were not done, 
but ought to have been done. At the outset of the Royal Commission, Commissioner Muirhead QC, who was originally the sole commissioner before he was joined by five others, and announced that he saw his job as not being merely to understand how each person died, but also to know why each person had died. Government confirmed his view by amendments subsequently made to the letters patent where it was declared that for the purpose of reporting on any underlying issues associated with the deaths, you are authorised to take account of social and cultural and legal factors, which, in your judgement, appear to have a bearing on those deaths. Tonight's presentation will focus on those underlying issues. The 97 reports on the individual deaths were prepared by the individual commissioners, which included Elliot Johnson. The five volume final reports summarise the findings of those individual deaths, addressing the underlying issues, including the social, cultural and legal factors that had a bearing on each death. Many of the individual coronial reports were scarifying reading. Many recounted a tragic trajectory of disadvantage, discrimination, negative contact with authorities, not just with the police and judiciary, but also welfare, hospitals, schools, all with repeated failures in these agents' duty of care. Yet the Royal Commission did not recommend a single criminal prosecution or referral to the relevant Department of Public Prosecutions. As you could imagine, this was a devastating outcome for the Aboriginal families and their communities, and many responded very badly to what they saw as not just a failure, but betrayal. Another compounding shock was a finding that rates of non-Aboriginal people dying in custody were effectively the same as those for Aboriginal people. Because the grossly disproportionate numbers of Aboriginal deaths were due to the vastly disproportionate numbers and the rates of Aboriginal incarceration. This fact led to the particular emphasis by the Royal Commission on the underlying issues behind that disparity in arrest and conviction rates for Aboriginal offenders. While the final report details copious amounts of those underlying issues in their long history, for many of us, one specific factor stands out even today. That was Johnson's identification of institutional racism as a prime cause of the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in the criminal justice system. He wrote of racism as being a constant experience for Aboriginal people, where he describes it in this way, the pinpricking, Domination, abuse of personal power, utter paternalism, open contempt and total indifference with which so many Aboriginal people were visited on a day-to-day -day basis. As senior commissioner, he not only identified institutional, now commonly called systemic racism, but also the widespread incomprehension and denial of it by most non-Aboriginal Australians. My experience in talking with non-Aboriginal people over many years, and including in the course of this commission, he said, is that many have great difficulty in understanding institutional racism in the sort of statement I have just quoted above about racism, that we lived it day by day, we went to bed with it. He continued, the difficulty is understandable. Many people in capital and main provincial cities have little contact at all with Aboriginal people and know little of their circumstances. Furthermore, they knew neighbours, friends, workmates who seem decent people, not given to go around abusing people for their colour, religion, etc. They knew similar people in other places. They can understand that there might be some bad apples in the barrel, 
But how can it be, they think, that Aboriginal people are experiencing racism every day? I think it is important to address this because it is, because it is not an uncommon view, including among people who think that what happened 200 years ago was wrong. This contribution is one of the most important and enduring insights of the Royal Commission. It is arguably the first such statement from an officer of the Australian Crown well before the 1999 British McPherson report on the murder of Stephen Lawrence and subsequent failures of the Metropolitan Police. So what were the criticisms of the impact of the findings of the Royal Commission? In the spirit of critical inquiry and facing hard truths, which Elliot Johnson embodied in his political and judicial lives, I want to note some criticisms of the Royal Commission or at least how the Commission's recommendations were implemented or not. As previously noted, some families continued their beliefs that their loved ones had been killed by police or corrections officers and were therefore dismayed that no criminal charges resulted. This clash of expectation is common in coronial inquests into so many suspicious deaths of Aboriginal, if not indeed all people. Some non-Aboriginal critics question whether a legal process like a Royal Commission could ever escape its colonial and Western origins and links to the racial state. Academic Machetti reflects this in his statement. The quasi-legal processes of a Royal Commission that appeared inclusive and concerned with redressing racial imbalances continued to re reiterate colonial dynamics and influence the identity of racialised others. Another academic, Sackett, argued the Royal Commission, and I quote, actually constituted a post-modernistic twist in the state's unrelenting struggles to fragment and reform the original Australians. At the same time, the plight of Aborigines was viewed with sympathy and concern, and Aborigines were granted an authorial role and social cultural divide between Aborigines and non-Aborigines were still targeted as the heart of the problem. For me, a disappointing weakness of the Royal Commission was a relatively lack of attention in the final report to the 11 Aboriginal women who died in custody compared to the 88 men. And that's because since 1991, the comparative rates of incarceration of Aboriginal women and girls has grown faster than those of Aboriginal men and boys. Marchetti rightly calls for an intersectional approach to the imprisonment and subsequent deaths of Aboriginal women as women equally alongside their Aboriginal identity. And I too agree. But any genuine attempt to address the disparities in Aboriginal imprisonment must also adopt a gendered view alongside examining racism in all its forms. But the most awful post trip to the Royal Commission is the fact that since 1991, a further 500 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have died in custody. Every major anniversary of the publication of the Royal Commission's final report has recorded dramatic increases in both the actual numbers and the rates of Aboriginal men, women and children in detention, many who are on remand. This is the result of ongoing competition between political parties of all persuasions to be seen as being tough on crime despite the Royal Commission's most fundamental finding that prison should be a last resort, not the only resort. In the Northern Territory, various legislative changes such as mandatory sentencing, paperless arrests, issues around parole and bail have all exacerbated the underlying causes that have led to higher incarceration rates of Aboriginal Territorians. The overall evidence for the failures of a punitive carceral system steadily mounts, but still 
most governments have yet to succeed in rising to the challenges of closing their judicial gaps. I am hopeful that we are now on track to do, the, to do this and I will outline what steps are underway in the Northern Territory towards the end of my talk. However, before I do that, let's consider Commissioner Hal Watton's informed response to criticism that the Royal Commission was to blame for this obscene postscript. He said, I get somewhat impatient with those who sacrimoniously point out that Indigenous incarceration rates have risen, not fallen since the Royal Commission, as though it's the Commission's fault and they are to totally absolved for, of responsibility. They speak as if it's a commission has given an ointment to rub on a wound and it hasn't healed. There are no magic ointments or silver bullets for complex social problems and the commission never claimed to have one. In this statement, Wharton explicitly calls out governments who have failed to seriously pursue the recommendations. Academics like Kadeen and MacDonald agree, and so do I. And that's because far too much money was wasted on infrastructure like beds, cells and blankets, and nowhere near enough was spent on Aboriginal empowerment and self-determination. Specifically, despite Johnson's stress on institutional racism, government responses were limited to largely cosmetic reforms of police and prison procedures and policies focused and designed to reduce alcohol abuse. While alcohol was clearly identified by the Commission as a primary contributing factor in Aboriginal offending, the refusal to confront systemic racism continues to undermine government's efforts to address Aboriginal over-representation over in custody. One of the more radical and significant steps the Commission took back then was to balance the efforts of the non-Aboriginal hom homogeny was the establishment, establishment of Aboriginal issues units. The Commissioners resolved to establish Aboriginal issues units in each of the six states and the Northern Territory almost a year and a half after the Royal Commission was established. The role of those Aboriginal issues units was described in the final report as to ensure that each commissioner hears and understands the views of Aboriginal and Aboriginal communities and organisations in his region about the reasons why so many Aboriginal people are in custody and die in custody and their views as to how the situation can be changed. I am aware that these units were established, but not one of them still exists. But it is this willingness to resource and listen to the unmediated voices of Aboriginal people that makes Elliot Johnson and his report the crucial event in the history of Aboriginal judicial reform. His attention to the underlying issues derived from the details of each coronial inquest. As one of the commissioners remembered. In most cases, we have come to know the history of the prisoner's community and his family and had followed the course of his life through the records of an unremitting surveillance, the files of protection and welfare authorities, foster homes and institutions, schools, police forces, juvenile justice institutions, prison, probation services and other agencies. Even before the prisoner's birth, his probable pattern of life was being laid down by a history of dispossession, discrimination, disadvantage and despair that had damaged his community. Along with alcohol, poor mental health, removal as a child, unemployment and many other factors. A fundamental underlying issue was disempowerment and systemic racism. And it is this systemic racism that successive governments have refused to identify and eliminate yet. It is without doubt 
the root cause of the rising imprisonment rates and the hundreds of deaths since the release of the final report. So let me return to the key messages of the Royal Commission, that the real problems are racism, colonialism and disempowerment, and the way forward is respecting partnerships and developing partnerships with Aboriginal people who are resourced to amplify their solutions. Taking our lead from this intervention, the Aboriginal Justice Unit of the Northern Territory's Department of Attorney General and Justice committed to developing an Aboriginal Justice Agreement. Guided by our then Aboriginal Reference Committee, I crisscrossed with my team the entire Territory over three years, visiting and listening to people in 120 Aboriginal communities ending in 160 consultations. We heard directly in those consultations from thousands of Aboriginal Territorians why offending rates were so high, what would reduce them, how they regarded police and the courts, and what were the barriers to them fixing the problem. We developed a comprehensive agreement to be delivered over seven years that has now received bipartisan support. It has three aims. One, to reduce offending and imprisonment of Aboriginal Territorians. Two, to engage and support Aboriginal leadership. And three, to improve justice responses and services for Aboriginal Territorians. It was of no surprise to anyone, especially me, that racism in all its forms was identified at every single one of those consults. And that's why a fundamental action under the third aim of the agreement is to identify and eliminate systemic racism in government agencies and contracted service providers that directly or indirectly discriminate against Aboriginal Territorians engaged in the justice system. To do this, we have commissioned a forensic report on how to address the racism, but it will need official backing and the political will to implement its recommendations. As with the Royal Commission, we may fall at this crucial hurdle, but we cannot afford to fail because the alternative is just not viable unless the government wants to build more prisons and spend a never-ending percentage of its limited budget on a doom strategy that has failed time and time again. <coughs> The Northern Territory is facing a demographic time bomb as more and more young people enter the child protection and juvenile justice systems. With little hope of averting graduation to adult offending and a revolving door of incarceration. As part of the Justice Agreement, we are heeding the Royal Commission's call for prison to be the only last resort by investigating viable alternatives to custody. These facilities, which we have one in Alice Springs for Aboriginal women and another one being developed for Aboriginal men in Groot Island, are already having positive impacts. And it is realistic to look forward to the cessation of prisons for women in the Northern Territory. Another core element of the Justice Agreement is the establishment of local law and justice groups who will proactively manage offending and their associated causes and the behaviours alongside community courts. These community courts will play critical roles for a more informed determination of appropriate judgments and sentencing options to stop a person's offending. What the Justice Agreement and its process has shown is that we can come up with the most robust solutions to wicked problems when we take seriously our responsibilities as servants of the public, in this case, Aboriginal Territorians. Without any doubt, this was one of the most significant learnings from Elliot Johnson's Royal Commission. And sadly, while it may be 31 years later, we can and we will finally deliver and respect the hard work of the incredible man that Elliot Johnson was alongside his challenges. Thank you for listening.
Vi tager med højre fyrt med. Thank you, Leanne, so much for your compelling speech, your strength in calling out the need for accountability, the effects and ongoing issue of structural and institutional racism, but also your way forward in terms of addressing the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people in incarcerated in the Northern Territory. Can we again thank Leanne for that incredible relation? <laughs> Leanne has kindly um, offered to answer a few questions. Um, so we'll be doing that both um, in the lecture theatre, but also there will be a couple online. We probably have about five minutes, some short questions. So um, I think, do we have a roaming, uh, great, a roaming um, microphone? Could you please um, state who you are and then your question? And um, if we could be succinct, that would be wonderful as we are a bit over time. So, if anyone would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Don't take one from Kerry. Ah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Leanne, do you think if the Royal Commission um, uh, was held today or, or, say, last year, would you expect a, a different outcome? How do you see in the, in the 40 years that's passed or the 30 years that's passed, do you see that there's been some improvement in that um, in the institutional racism that was um, that Johnson found? Uh, no, I don't. I, I honestly feel that we haven't moved as far ahead as we like, despite the efforts. I think um, when there are strong Aboriginal people that speak about institutional racism. They are um, isolated or, or or not supported because it's not a polite it's not a polite discussion to call out racism, um, but the fact that it was raised at every single consult as an issue as to why Aboriginal people couldn't access services in the Northern Territory that kept them and kept them away from the justice system was. Um, a, a, an insight to me how far we've still yet to come. And I'll give you, I'll give you an, a, an example. So um, in the Northern Territory, 75% of Aboriginal people live outside of Aboriginal areas. 120 languages are spoken by Aboriginal people, which 75% of Aboriginal people speak as a second language. But during Triple O, to get police, to get an ambulance to get a, a fire truck to your house and that person on the other end can only understand English. But if you speak German, French, Italian, Russian, you name it, there's a policy in the system that links you to an interpreter to be able to get interpretation of your, your need at the time of a crisis. How can we have ignored 30% of the Northern Territory's population and the fact that we know that, that the language of Aboriginal people is spoken as a second or third language, and yet we know Aboriginal people are the highest users of that system, you tell me how that can be ignored because I think we've been shouting out long and hard for that. My worry is that domestic and family violence victims have been making those calls into that triple O call centre and haven't been heard. And when they have eventually called back because they can't be heard, it's no longer just a minor domestic and family violence incident that might have been the sex assault being thrown at the partner. It is now a medivac out on the RFDS and a murder charge is online. Like, we've got to get better and smarter at what we do. And I just, it just, it amazes me that we, can just pretend that that's a fair and equitable system. So, yes. Thank you, Leanne. We have another question just down the back and then we'll check if we've got any questions online. Not as yet, thank you. Uh, Jenny Baker, I'm retired. I used to be at Flinders and Adelaide and UniSA. Um, I'm, I was uh, at the um, Adelaide Uni when uh, um, 
um, Elliot Johnston handed down his uh, findings to community people there. And um, I was with Sandra, well, I was sitting with Sandra Saunders um, and then I saw her run out and I went uh, and followed her out. She was totally devastated that no convictions, and he, she was the director of ALRM at the time, she was totally devastated um, that there were no convictions for the, any of those atrocious situations, those murderous situations. I just wondered, does anyone know why Elliot wasn't able to swing those other commissioners around to, to laying some charges against those murderers? No, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it certainly wasn't reflected in the reports and um, I, I, I can't answer your question because I just don't know the answer unless someone else can. No, but they have the power to recommend any matters to the DPP and, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know the answers. Sorry. We'll just have one, um, we'll have one final question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Leanne, my name's Brian Jeffries. I'm a, an arts education and theology graduate from Flinders and uh, past parish priest Anglican in Alice Springs, Central Australia. Um, having been the visitor to the Alice Springs prison for the last eight years and the Barclay Work Camp for the last eight years, um, what would, would you like to share... Um, just one of the challenges you face in the Northern Territory as head of the Aboriginal Justice Unit to um, face or confront institutional racism? There Apart are many. Yeah, just the one. <laughs> um, I think uh, there are many. Uh, I think the, the biggest hurdle for me is convincing those in power that we need to have change and that that change is imminent if we are to treat people fairly. I don't believe we have a justice system that's just in its current form, but looking forward, I think there are ways that we can make the justice system much fairer and the barriers that are present every day, even when I'm not in my position in government, when I walk down the street in Darwin and Alice Springs, there's this othering. And I, I think the worst thing for me is when people say to me, how come you littles aren't like the others? And I go, what do you mean? Who are the others? And I go, they're the others that can't access the services. They can't stand on their, their two feet and punch a fight and throw, you know, like get angry and have an argument without, you know, it take, I think it takes a lot of courage and strength for people to have and confront racism and when they don't, I think that we uh, see that reflected in substance abuse and misuse and people need to recognise that as a product of when people aren't valued in a system. Thank you for those questions. I'll ask Tanya to come back to the lectern. Thank you. Thank you, Simone, for moderating tonight's Q&A and a uh, huge thanks uh, to Leanne for such a powerful and thought-provoking address. We Thank do you. truly appreciate your continued connection with Fingers Law and the impact that you have made and continue to make. And I'd now like to invite this is University's Vice Chancellor, Professor Tom Sterling, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, thank you, thank you, Tanya. Um, distinguished guests, um, everyone who's come here tonight, everyone who's um, um, zooming in or whatever means that is um, online, welcome. Um, I do hope you've enjoyed the event. It's been extremely powerful. Uh, I'd also uh, want to start by acknowledging that, that we are meeting on Garna Yarta and pay my respects to um, Uncle Lewis, to elders past, present and emerging, to also 
um, extend that respect to the elders uh, of all of the lands uh, on which Flinders University operates uh, throughout South Australia and uh, the Northern Territory. Wow. That was difficult to hear. Um, you know, and I, you know, as a, as a relatively recent Australian, you can tell by my accent, I didn't grow up here. As a recent Australian, um, I, I think we, we my, my family and I passed the, the citizenship test um, probably about four years ago now. Seems to me that some of this stuff would have been far more important learning than knowing what sport Donald Bradman paid, played. Mm. Mm. Uh, it was very difficult to listen to, uh, and, I, and I thank you for your compelling insights uh, into, um, some, into some very difficult issues that frankly should be at the forefront of all uh, Australians' minds. We're celebrating 30 years of Flinders Law. You know, it's interesting, one thinks about just how far Flinders Law has come in 30 years, just how much can be done in 30 years, and you've just described, you know, the absolute antithesis of that, which is how little can be done in 30 years. Uh, and so I think that all of us thank you for your work, your advocacy, uh, and your leadership. It's, you have a very powerful voice. Of course, at Flinders, um, we um, are committed to ensuring that we recognize uh, as much as we can and embrace uh, indigenous peoples, their knowledges, their cultures, uh, and we're also committed to providing a safe, a culturally safe environment uh, for all of our students to learn in. Um, and of course, we're um, in an advanced stage of developing our, our, um, our second reconciliation action plan. Uh, and it's something that is a whole of university initiative. It's something that through our people, our researchers, our educators, our students, uh, and alumni like you, Leanne, uh, that it's through them that, that we hope to be able, in our small way, to be able to make meaningful and lasting change, uh, the sort that Elliot Johnson spoke of more than 30 years ago. But as you say, 30 years since that Muirhead Commission handed down nearly 340 recommendations, you mentioned that one of them was that incarceration should be the, 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 the last resort. Evidently, it isn't. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are still the most incarcerated people um, on the planet. Um, children in custody, still deaths in custody. So it's clear um, from all of your, the, the case that you've made, um, it's clear that we must do better, we can do better, and Australia will be a better society when we do. Um, at Flinders, of course, um, we are rightly proud of all of our alumni. There's several in the room, it's clear. Some of you have already identified yourselves. Uh, we're very proud of all of our alumni. We're proud of uh, our graduates and the many contrib contributions that they make uh, to uh, their communities, the communities in which they live, uh, and through their chosen professions. Uh, and indeed, as mentioned earlier, each year we acknowledge and we celebrate exceptional contributions through our prestigious Flinders University Alumni Awards. Now, in 2021, as you've heard, um, uh, one such recipient was the very person who has uh, addressed us this evening. Leanne's Distinguished Alumni Award was in recognition of her outstanding and sustained um, contributions to the community. But unfortunately, due to a little thing called COVID um, and various border closures, Leanne was unable to attend our gala dinner and awards ceremony. And so it gives me enormous pleasure to be able to take this opportunity to present, to present Leanne with her Distinguished Alumni Award for her leadership and commitment to justice over the past 30 years, including the Aboriginal Justice Agreement for the Northern Territory. Thank you for your ongoing activism and commitment to improving the lives of those around you. So if you would care, please, Leanne, to join me. Just move over a bit, move that way. Colin, Colin, move that way. Move that way so you're out of the, yeah, keep going. Oh, oh, oh. you see, I always do as I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> so look, it just remains for me to thank you all. Thank, of course, Leanne, thank you all for coming. 
Um, I do hope that you'll enjoy the, um, the networking and some refreshments that we have um, outside for you. But just before you do, one last time, will you join me uh, in thanking Leanne Little for her oration? I want, I want.